Hey there. Good morning. I want to salute you to the top of the morning to you for today's four, day 14 of our manifesting challenge with my coffee chat. Today, what came to mind is I was reflecting on Noah Trevor's uh, memoir. Um, let's see, it's memoir born a crime. And Trevor Noah, as a co famous comedian, was born in South Africa at a time where having sex with in, interracial sex was a crime. And he was a biracial child. And, you know, he grew up at the time of apartheid. But his mother was someone that taught him, trained him to think of a world that was beyond apartheid, beyond segregation, beyond uh, limits. And she trained him to think of a world of what he'd like to create. Because keep in mind, at the time and in that era and that location, the big dream or the big vision that anybody would have, their goal in life, was to maybe add an extra room onto their house, or maybe someday they could add a driveway to their home, or maybe a, an, an iron fence that surrounded the, the property. That would be a big goal. But they were never taught to dream beyond that. And this was triggering some thoughts of mine and reflecting back with clients that I've recently worked with. Uh, one of my mentoring students was sharing something similar. She was a biracial uh, child, and there were these, what I call programming, a set of belief systems of what she could achieve in terms of, let's say, education or careers or the path she could take. Now, that created what I called blinders in her world and in her perception of what she could create for herself, where the possibilities lie. And I see that with all of us, regardless if it's a, it's a racial issue, a cultural issue, or even male, female, in terms of, you know, when I was raised, it's like girls were secretaries, or, you know, I remember my dad telling me that I should become a pharmacist. And my perception at the time were all the pharmacists in my town were Asian. And I didn't think I had what it took to be a pharmacist because I didn't look like them. I mean, how silly does that get, right? And so I see this over and over and over with clients of how unknowingly we limit or we are programmed based on the set of our cultural beliefs or our family's beliefs and societal and the era. And <clears throat> unbeknownst to us, those are directing us on the path that we take. I was reflecting, too, on a client of mine who became a teacher in her culture. This She was living in Dubai. In her culture, as a teacher, that was a very highly regarded position for a woman. And it turns out that she did that, and she didn't seem to get respect from her family, which was what she was really, really looking for. She was looking for validation in her life that she mattered ultimately, that just doing the job wasn't fulfilling her. So she came up with the idea, since her brother was an attorney, her father was a very successful and highly regarded attorney, that she would go to law school and become an attorney. And after a number of years, she realized she wasn't fulfilled doing that work. Yeah, she was really good at it. She was probably better than both of them. And as she was gaining experience and, and, and applying it, but at the end of the day, it wasn't fulfilling her and it wasn't fulfilling her end goals of what she wanted to create in her life, which was being content and happy and fulfilled within herself, having a family um, and feeling like she could um, really be valued um, for who she was and what she did in the world, not because she was doing it ultimately for recognition from her dad, from her brother. She wanted to be validated by everybody in the family until she realized that she wasn't getting it there either. 
She was always in what I call competition. Competition with them, but at a deeper level, she was in competition with herself. She wanted to constantly do better, which she did, but it was never enough. It was never fulfilling. There was always an empty, there was a void. So I found that that was interesting because she was highly critical of herself. And no matter how much she did, she could never feel it was enough. And so then there, we, we've created a cycle, right, of self-perpetuating lack of fulfillment and keep thinking there's something outside of ourself that's going to fill that void. And I'm all for setting goals. That's why we're here in Manifesting Challenge, right? But ultimately, sometimes we reach those goals. That's happened for me in my own career. Even once I got to a phase of getting to be successful and making six figures in, in a record amount of time, this was back in the 80s, there was something missing. What is that something? That something was that connection with myself and knowing there was a bigger purpose to what I was doing and why I was here. So I know that we're not all at that phase or at that stage. And so we're all we're at where we're at. And so I've been at the various phases along my life and I've seen the evolution or the growth that I've created, but it's coming to that awareness of, you know, what's motivating me at the crux of it. You know, when I was working with this client, I'm just going to call her um, uh, Brenda. And Brenda didn't even understand that she was being limited by her family programming of what was acceptable because of her biracial status. And so a lot of these things are not spoken about. I know that we're getting more, uh, you know, this, these discussions are coming out into the open much more, but we don't understand that where our, our it, the prejudice starts from in, within, you know, and where we set limits based on how we perceive our outside world. So my come from is let's change the inside so that we can change the outside because that is what we end up creating. If we can see a world beyond apartheid, which is what Trevor's mother taught him to see beyond apartheid, to create that world within him, to then create a world by his internal vision, he can actually manifest that in the outside world. So with that, I'd like to invite, um, you know, whoever might have some questions on or comments on where they keep themselves stuck and where they notice maybe there's got some blinders and maybe maybe not even knowing where the blinders are. That's that's the revelation for most of us. So uh, I think I've got Karen here. Karen, did you want to unmute and, 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 and say good morning? Yes. Hello to everyone and to you, Amira. Thank you so much for continuing to do this. It's quite a commitment and it shows your dedication to helping us, uh, all of us who are tuned in. So what are you noticing? Have you noticed any blind spots or limits that maybe that you've put on yourself and your vision and perhaps how you could do it or what you could do? I, I really love the story of that mother. And I've seen this a lot in certain cultures where they are limited um, for whatever reason, government or cultural um, restrictions. And I love it that the, that message to her is probably one of the most powerful things I'll hear like all month, you know, that was, that was a beautiful thing of, of her encouraging her child to, to imagine beyond it. And I was very lucky that, um, you know, I have quite a creative imagination. And I think as I move forward with, with my one tremendous, you know, my one uh, thing um, uh, that I'm, as I move along that path and as it opens up and the energy clears and the focus gets grounded, that I'm leaving myself open for that project to breathe. So for me, it's really about just clearing off the table and allowing that to happen and not getting too distracted while still, of course, performing the things that we need to do that, you know, we can't just ignore, but realize that all in due time. And as you, you find the right path, it will flow. Well, and that's, I guess it comes back to that point in the conversation of how do we get grounded, right? And where are we focusing? What are we focusing? Are we focusing on the small stuff? like I talked about yesterday, or are we focusing on that bigger picture? 
And the small stuff would be the limits, our perspective, our feelings in the moment, um, and being grounded. So if we could just find a spot where we can let go of all the buzz, all the distractions, all of the peripheral noise, you know, that we are, you know, we're bombarded with in today's society, we're, we're, it's coming at us from every angle. And so we have to quiet that noise and be able to focus on something. And I think that was my intention with one incredible thing. Let's just start with one thing. And as we clear the energy to focus on that one thing, we're going to accomplish a lot of other stuff that was really important too. And so that's the magic of this and realizing it's so super simple. You know, I think our anxiety gets us tripped up and that's part of that unconscious programming, right? That's running like at the subconscious level we don't even know is, is creating for us, unbeknownst to us. So um, our vision is important, being grounded, being able to be present. So what does that mean for you, Karen? How do you apply being present? Well, yeah, we spoke a little bit yesterday about how, you know, some of the grounding things and last couple of days that I've done, but also I really love the testimonial yesterday and seeing this, the, the incredible to me, 180 degree turn by the other person that was, I don't know if I should say her name, but anyway, that was on yesterday, loved it that as soon as she started to allow herself to receive the flow started for her and boy things were just falling into place for her now for me one of the exercises I do in, in, in addition to the ones that we've discussed before was that I literally will sit there when I'm doing some breathing exercises or clearing the chakras as we discussed and I will imagine that I let loose the my, my human body skin that it just releases down and kind of fold and folds down it's like a costume that I unzip it and, and it folds down and then I, I allow my soul to breathe. And I what's love that. Isn't it? And so what was interesting is that when the Queen Elizabeth in all her ceremonies, they actually talked about that she um, had told a little story to, I think, one of the grandchildren that to inspire the origin, uh, if you look at the Latin roots, is to breathe, you know, to, and, and I thought, and you actually brought up the word encourage. And the root of the word encourage yesterday. I think it was enthusiasm, right? Full mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Oh, it was an enthusiasm. Yeah. I, okay. Yes. Maybe it yeah. was is in, yeah, enthusiasm. Yes. And it was a great tie-in. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, I was reflecting too on an exercise that I teach in my trainings. And one way to start, like when we get caught up in our buzz, is to imagine a little gold ball in the center of our head. And let that, with our eyes closed, just let that little gold ball roll down into your heart. And when that reaches your heart, just imagine it to fill up the whole chest cavity. And when we speak or when we decide to, um, oh, make a plan or when we are trying to decide what to do first, we can go to that place and just, it shifts our energy and we can step out of the anxiety or the, the buzz that we get caught up in, right? The nervousness or the panic or the confusion. And then when we speak from that place, there's a sense of ownership. There's a sense of conviction. Yes, that's real for me. Versus when we're speaking from our head, it's, it's, it's a huge shift coming back into being present, yeah. And, and you know, I think uh, it was the day before yesterday that I said that I used that technique that you taught me. And that was, I think back in 2017 or 2018, you taught me that technique. And I really appreciated that because I went back to that recently, just in the last week or two during this challenge. And I found it to be wonderful for getting out, like you said, getting out of your head, getting grounded. And it's also like you're kind of peering out from that grounded space. Um, and, and somebody, I, I taught it to someone the other day or shared that, um, that oh, good. What you had taught. and you know, they said, Oh, that, you know, but that's the emotional. And I thought, Oh, I said, no. And, and I would love to see how you would respond to that. Cause she was, Oh, but I'm already so emotional if it's from my heart. And I thought, Oh, I'll have to have Amira explain the difference because I tried to, but I think you're going to say it so much more succinctly. Okay, so I, I actually left a wee bit out of that. So here's what we do. When we're in our head, so the little gold ball is a reminder. 
it, it takes us, it sort of gives us a direction to refocus our mind. So the mind goes back down into the heart. And when we come into the heart, what we want to think about in that point, if we can, some of us are so adept at it, we can quickly shift into it. Some of us need to back it up a wee bit and think about a happy time, a real happy time in your life. Maybe it was a day you got married. Maybe it was the day you gave birth. Maybe it was your kid's first birthday. Some important time in your life where you felt the most, the happiest, the best. And when you're in that spot, just notice the shift there. So we are shifting our mind. We're shifting our focus. We're shifting our feelings. Actually, we're bringing ourselves to a higher vibration. It's also a part of grounding because we can literally in that moment instantly ground ourselves and be present here now, but be thinking of that time in the past where we felt so fantastic. When I practice or when I do this technique with my clients, when I'm doing a live presentation, they literally fall over. Because the body can't hold the old program of whatever is sort of def defunct or not working for them. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly powerful if we can stop ourselves when we're having that moment of panic or we're finding ourselves spin around and do this exercise. I so, love it. Yeah, so, so to answer your question, yeah. we're raising our vibration. Yes, that's affecting our emotions. It's also affecting our thoughts, isn't it? Right. She was, I think it was, the, she, she took it as a literal thing um, that you're coming from your heart and that, that therefore it would be emotional. And I like the yeah. way you explained it. And that was one of the things I think I suggested, or I had said the other day, when you took uh, us through a little, um, a little thing you did a couple of times, I thought, man, that that's really beneficial. You just explained it, but you could also say, let's take a moment to do this. Well, and I find, you know, years ago I was guided to stop reading. I was guided to stop reading all of these wonderful, incredible books. And I, I had a library, a pretty extensive library when, before I moved to Dubai, I sold over and gave it all away. But here's the thing why my guides probably encouraged me to stop reading, because it's no longer about intellectual, uh, you know, information. It's not about getting more information, because ultimately, when we truly connect with our soul and our higher self, we can access everything that we need to know in the moment or where we need to go for our next step. But the whole practice is learning how to be present. It's not learning about who you were in a past life. That information is fun and exciting to know that you lived an adventurous or a remarkable past life. We all did. We also had some very dark past lives, okay? And most of us don't want to you know, give it any credence to that. But those past lives are give us information that we can use, and oftentimes our skills can be enhanced, or we use that knowledge to use to apply for this lifetime here and now. But that's the point of where it's relevant, right? So the whole exercise of my guides is telling me, teaching me how to be present, because that's where our power lies in creating and manifesting for this life. This now is what matters. And most I, oh, of us, I love that last sentence. That that is definitely going to go in quote marks. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, was because ultimately we just want to be happy, right? We want to feel fulfilled. We mm -hmm. want to feel whole. I mean, I think that's the ultimate goal of everybody. And you said it so well earlier. It's not about the things you have or the status you have or the job you have. It comes back to the happiness within. And how do we get there? Mm -hmm. You know, it comes with one step at a time. I loved, Karen, how you shared yesterday, you know, you stopped yourself or took a, a quick look within a day, you know, how you lost yourself to everybody else, which was an old pattern of yours. Well, that's fine. Not to beat yourself up. You're aware of it now. And it's only when we become aware of a pattern can we shift it. So there is some conscious awareness of it instead of you being, you know, swept away with a current, you, you know, before you could have lost months and years as, as you did giving everything away, 
And you did that and check that box with it. Give yourself a great big massive star. You did amazing. But now it's about you and fulfilling what's really here. For a lot of us, you know, we have to dig deep and it might take a little while, uh, some energy practices where we can finally connect with what we've long forgotten. Maybe some of us have never connected with it. You know, I started to talk about something the other day. I'm not sure that I explained it to the fullest because sometimes I start channeling and I get swept away. So bear with me. But I thought about, you know, the answers. When I was talking about Puna's story, I think that was what, day nine or day 10 of the challenge. And what it was, was her secret, the answer for her in finding her, her new business career and purpose was from her childhood. So it's oftentimes things that we like to do when we were a kid. And I was sharing this with somebody that I was talking to the other day is as a kid on the summer holidays, when everybody's supposed to be playing what I do, and maybe you did too, is I played school. My aunt bought us this great big green board and you could flip it over and there'd be black on the, on the other side. Everybody liked the black side because you could see it better and it wrote better. But I would teach the kids. I, I gar- rounded up my sisters and um, neighbor kids, whoever I could get, and I would teach them English and math. I don't know what I taught them, but they would get bored within about 10 minutes, right? And so I'd make them sit, they had to sit through class. And so I was laughing at that, how my disciplinarian, you know, was really there. And of course, my sister called me bossy, right? Because I was telling her what to do all the time. So anyway, that's the role of a big sister, right? But I was so intent on teaching and keeping them disciplined or keeping them focused. And I had to laugh at myself because here I am, you know, (laughs) trying to teach how to be disciplined and focus on on something specific, but I'm teaching, aren't I? (laughs) Well, I like that two things that you said it ties into when you say go to your happiest uh, place Mm -hmm. sometimes that is from our childhood and in our childhood we would create we would sit there and imagine things that rang true to us because we didn't have all the layers or you know all the belief systems or what the other people said so you're right exactly right and uh, you're gonna think this is funny but in my very first preschool this little boy and I somehow snuck out of the room with the other children went to this other room and he said he said, let's play. And I said, okay, I'll be the teacher and you be the student. And he said, no, let's play mommy and daddy. <laughs> but it was so funny that he wanted to play parents. I wanted to be the teacher just like you did, uh, Vera. So yeah, that's yeah. really funny. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, ultimately, I think we're all teachers, aren't we? And we're all students. You know, it's a love of different- yeah, it's a love of yeah, learning. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, but again, you know, in Puna's case, you know, her, she named her business, her nickname, which was Cupcake. There, her family called her at four years old, Cupcake. So she had a yearning and a desire for desserts her whole life. Now, was that their programming of her? Or was it something she just loved? So they called her Cupcake, you know? So anyway, I thought that was so amusing. And I look at people um, and we see the pattern show up. And so the secret is, what is it that you really love to do? What makes you the happiest? What makes you want to get up in the morning and and keep getting up every morning? You know, and when the chips get down, what is it you love and will continue to do? Yeah. Hey, Dr. Rebecca, thanks for joining us. Was there something you wanted to add to, to our conversation today? It's nice to see you. Well, I wanted to come and see you and um, I wanted to tell you, so uh, last time I came to see you, I was telling you that I had this interview for this research role and I was like terrified to do it because I really had to get out of my way because I'd never spoke to a search committee before and I was like, I was completely freaked out. So I spent the entire week notice that they had given me putting together this presentation and practicing the presentation um, and they loved it. And I, I don't know what the other steps are in this process, um, but I, I'm supposed to hear back in a couple of weeks. Um, and they all at the time told me how thorough 
my presentation was and how clear it was and how much they enjoyed it. And, and the one, um, as you know, I, I love to write. And so the one she goes, I wasn't planning on asking this question or anticipating it, but do you see part of this role as like assisting our students with, with their publications and how much do you like to write? And it was all very funny because I had already anticipated this because to me, when I read the job description, this was obviously included in there. Um, and so it was just, it was very funny. And so I wanted, I wanted to share that with you. And then in my, in my current role- no, having, Wait, can I just interrupt that? Would you say yeah. that was your, your researcher mind that could see it was obvious? Because obvious, it wasn't obvious to them. Maybe, I, I don't really know. Or was it your perception or your intuition that gleam there's something well, more here? Say. I don't really know, but when I read it, it's either way, or maybe it's both, right? I, I don't know. I ha I don't, it's like I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and I thought it was funny that this, this person is the rational person in my life that when I need to speak to somebody who's a, another rational person, I go, what do you think? And, and, you know, we were laughing about this and my friend goes, why is this funny? And I'm like, I don't know. There's something here that I just find funny. It's the same sort of thing. Like, I don't know why it was obvious to me and not even to them who posted for the role. But it was That's because your obvious. clairvoyance is kicking in. That's why. But it was very obvious to me. And, and you know, I've been working on, on myself and being seen. And, like, I'm having an issue in my current role with this person who I feel like is trying to bully me. And I was like, well, maybe you should just ask me what I mean. Which is, like, so funny because the old me would have just crumbled and been like, oh, I have to get small. Um, but I'm really like, I don't care. I'm not here to play these stupid little games, you know. Um just how I feel about it like we're not playing stupid little games so um I don't know like I'm still doing all those things that you and I were talking about about what are you doing differently you know um but well, it was and, very and, you're, and, and it seems to me that you're visualizing a different outcome you know um yeah. like like if you want to have a, ha a good day at work, let's say, or a good relationship with this person, it's almost like you have to have that picture in your mind when you step into the office or you step on a Zoom call with that person. How do you want it to um, complete? What's the experience you want to have in that experience? So that's all part of our mock-ups, right? And what you can do on your side is literally clean off the energies that are blocking you from having that final picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, because there's some, perhaps there's some resistance from them and, and from you too. And then you could even turn around and literally ask them, like, what would you, what would be your goal with this? Or what's your goal in trying to sabotage this situation? Yeah. Uh, exactly. And so, um, or ultimately it, what would be their, the goal that you're both trying to achieve and can you agree on trying to achieve that together? Right. Would that work? I don't know. I don't know this person well enough, you know, oh, okay. I've, uh, I've okay. been trying to do little things like that. Um, so here's a trick that I do when I'm going to communicate with somebody that's not that receptive. Like sometimes you've reached out to somebody and they're just like on another plane or another alternate dimension. And so what I will do is I'll just envision in my mind, like on the screen of my mind, I envision a, a symbol that represents them and a symbol that represents me. And I'll join them with a rose in the middle. So heart to heart or just emoji or avatar to avatar and just see a heart in the, in the middle. So it's not, it's, you're not creating a love relationship, but you're clearing the energy connection with a love vibration that can really reset the energy. Love is a very, very high frequency. So that might That's clear it. Just, just a try, you know, see if it works for you. I will try it and I'll let you know, um, we, I probably won't hear this month, so I'll have to email you because we probably won't be doing these things, but I'll let you know how the interview uh, turns out, what, what happens with that process. How do you feel about it? I feel good about it. And I think that ultimately I'm going to get that role. And, you know, I was talking to some of my colleagues last night who had helped me with my presentation. Um, and, you know, we're all we're all doctorate level holders and 
you know, we've all done a lot of stuff together. And, and one of them said to me, you know, I think this is where your heart's always been in this academic research space. And, you know, I think this is where you've been being led to. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's true. You know, I think that's where I'm at with it. So I think that these other, these other things that are going on in the background, like, you know, people that are trying to mess with my Zen and, and, and these other things that are going on, and I say trying because they're not succeeding in it, but I feel like that's what they're trying to do. Well, uh, keep in um, mind, it's not about them. It's about you. Right. Um, We're creating the appearance of these people trying to sabotage us. Correct. Um, and, you know, I think that those are all short, like short term issues. Like, I think I'll be, I'll be moving on. Um, but I'm. I'm waiting. Again, till again, I get all again of that I'm in. sorry to interrupt your thought pattern, but you said, I think I'll be moving on. What do you want to create? Because you can sort of waffle. That's even sort of an undetermined outcome. That's not trusting yourself when you said, I think I'm going to be moving on. No, you are moving on. No, you are stepping into your power. No, you are acknowledging more of who you are and what you stand for. And I want to go do what I love. That's what I want. That's I want right. And I think I remember I when you first reached out to me over a couple of years ago, is that you were wanting to coach other academics. Wasn't that correct? Maybe. I don't remember that far back. I've slept since then, Amira, but maybe <laughs> that's possible. <laughs> You've got a great <laughs> memory. I really applaud that. Yeah. Well, good for you. I think I think you've made great headway. Another tool is um, like being with difficult people that are can be overbearing or intimidating or ridiculous. A practice that I teach is, you know, Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca is greater than anyone else, whoever you want to put there. Versus when you look at the, the formula, typically it will go Rebecca's less than. So it's like moving that little in, you know, arrow, that algebra sign to I'm greater than. It doesn't mean you're a better person in any stretch of the imagination, but you can put yourself first. Your energy is greater than anything outside of yourself. Does that make any sense? I am a better person. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know no, you are. I, I know. You it's our little secret. Yeah, it's our little secret. Until yeah. you send this out to everybody and then everybody will know, right? <laughs> no, but if we don't put ourselves first and, and greater than, nobody else will. It that doesn't mean correct. stepping on somebody else. It doesn't mean overtaking and arm wrestling everybody that you and you know enter in a conversation. But it's like it, it's it's a self-love, it's a self-respect, it's a it's a self knowingness of your truth of who you are and you know we're continually getting boop, 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 moving up and up and up and up and up in that ability to understand and value ourselves at greater and greater levels you know we weren't born with yeah I think we were born knowing all of that but of course we forgot we fell into this pit of amnesia and we got programmed by our parents and our culture and our society telling us what's valuable. And then, you know, some of us made decisions to think or to say that we're not valuable because we're a girl perhaps, or because we didn't come from a wealthy family or because we didn't have connections or because we didn't whatever, fill in the blank. Yeah, I think that that's, that's very true. And I think that you can, you can be, I can be greater than all these other people without stepping on anyone. Like, I don't think it's about stepping on people because I think that I think my role here, wherever I go, right, is to elevate the people that I encounter and to help them grow. And so it's not about me being better than you in a way that makes you somehow subhuman or less than me by conventional standards. It's just about, I'm here to help people grow and, and elevate. Yeah, and each of us are in different ways. And I think people okay. get hung up on that too, because I think when you start, you know, when we start thinking about ourselves, right, 
people react to that and it's oh well you think you're so much better than me and it's it's not even about that it's about you know well here let's elevate let's elevate well, everyone and, and a word that comes to mind is insecurity. Um, when somebody goes to that place, they're insecure with who they are and they just have a little work to do <laughs> to catch up. That's all. Yeah, Karen, you wanted to add something? Oh, I was just gonna say, um, first of all, I love the image or the visualization of when you go, before you see that person, you have a rose between you because that automatically elevates, like you said, to that love position a friend had told me that um, there was someone that was really annoying at work and so she visualized her doing everything that she wished that she would do that you know um, not invade her space not interrupt her with other people and do you know it it worked um, sometimes they'll say to visualize a whole conversation at the end say well this is what I'm trying to achieve this is what you're trying to achieve this is a win-win for both of us but then what I loved what you said there um, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I love that you said you're there and you want to help others and raise them up. Well, by your manner of how you deal with this person, you are, you're saying, I may not like what you're doing or condone what you're doing, but I'm, I'm going to treat you in this manner. And, and maybe this will help elevate you <laughs> that higher, higher. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. So that was really fun to listen to. Thank you. And for difficult people, I'm thinking about what other tools I would use. Sometimes people aren't ready to come around. Sometimes they're in their little, you know, they're having a moment. Uh, you know, what I, I, I often do this because like I shared with um, Marie Pierre yesterday is, you know, she got pissed off. Something I said, I can't even remember exactly what it was because why? And I, Marie Pierre, I'm not picking on you, honey. I'm just using this as a powerful example. We get pissed off because we're in resistance. There's something deep within us that wants to make a shift. And we can't either, it's the word someone said or a lesson or something they shared that's triggering something with us that is sort of like, it's uncomfortable, right? But she was able to take herself beyond that and let it go. So when I'm dealing with, let's say I've made somebody annoyed or I've said something that is truth and my, it's not my intention to hurt. I didn't even know it hurt them in fact, right? I will, if, but if I do know somebody is either difficult, having a, a, a difficult time, maybe they're in a physical challenge, maybe they got major life issues with their family, uh, career problems, financial, whatever the issue is, I'll send them a gold rose. And I'll just let and know it's like a blessing from God. I know that they'll, that will rose is complete with everything they need to make them, to bring them into either the alignment to know what they need to know, to understand their next step, to be at peace, to be less anxious, whatever the, it is, it's not for me to decide what they need, right? All I know is I can support them by sending them that rose. It costs me nothing, just a flash of a thought, right? And you can right now sit there and think of a gazillion people that you know are struggling right now, send them a gold rose don't call them up and say, hey, did, how are you feeling now? You might in a few days. Or what I find interesting is oftentimes they'll call me or they'll reach out if, if they know me. But you'll be amazed because that's another way you can give, right? It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't take any time. And so that is shifting the vibration of other people so they can get their information and, and take their next step. That's maybe, funny they're, maybe they're just having a really, really bad day. They, they're so anxious and they can't think themselves out of a, a wet paper bag at this moment, right? We've all been there, right? We just don't know what to do. We know we're capable of getting the answer, but for whatever reason, we're blocked. So that rose is helpful for difficult situations in, in the workplace or your spouse or anyone at your kids. Let's say you're not, I know a lot of people are on different pages or on different level of beliefs with their kids and they they're not seeing eye to eye send your kids the gold rose and then pull back your energy from them 
I know as a mom, it's very, very difficult for you to not be involved with their life. But pull your energy back. That will empower them to get clear on where they want to go and make the correct decision for themselves. Yeah. Hope that's so funny, Amira, because I I've had sessions with you sometimes where I've gotten really mad and I'm like, well, I don't know how to do this. And so like I'm really mad and I'm more mad at me than 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 at you. Well, and it's like, and it's so funny, like that one that we had where I had that whole twin thing going on, and I was like, why do I have this twin thing? And you were like, oh, well, ask. And I'm like, no, tell me. And I was like, okay, I got to calm down and I got to do it the way you're telling me to do it. And then I was like mad that I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, why can't I figure this out? Because, you know, I overanalyze everything, like everything. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Like everything. Well, and we do, you know, I'm a great worrier. I'm a great analyzer. And I, and, you know, this has been part of my frustration at the career level and even trying to help people understand what exactly I do, because I leave a lot of the words out. I just want to go to the end result, right? And then <laughs> people like you and Karen, you want me to explain what's going to happen and how it's going to work. And I'm like, trust me. Well, I have to give you something to be able to trust me in the first place, right? And so it's a funny thing, but, you know, simple is is better simple is the power and so when we can catch ourselves over analyzing is is huge yeah it's really true and it's really hard sometimes like but i know i do that so well, i um and I, you're so I'm good at it and that's part of sort of you're so good at it and you're so using it for your work. It's become your best friend, right? That is your best. And I do it sometimes without realizing that I'm doing it because just the way my brain works, I don't always know that that's an, an analyzing thing going on. So sometimes I don't catch it, but you know, I know that I do that. And I, I actually have some people in my life that will help me with that where I'll go, okay, I know I'm overanalyzing this and I don't need to analyze this and I need someone to tell me the other piece of this because I can't I can't figure this out by myself because I'm so stuck in this other space um so it all it all works but yeah and 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 and, and to add to that it's like the reason we can't often figure it out is because it's something from another let's call it a dimension an aspect that's hidden that isn't even analytical or analyzable. Right. Because if it's coming from something when you were four or five or eight years old, will you set up a pattern? Maybe it doesn't even relate, but it is affecting it. So it keeps you in a loop and you can't get your answer. Well, I think some of those things we're no longer consciously aware of yeah. And that goes back to what I was saying to you the last time I talked to you about those those computer virus things and running in the background. Because I think when it's that, when you're that young, I mean, I remember a lot from that time, but I don't remember all the stories that were programmed to me at that time. Right. And I know for myself, like every time I turn around since, since I decided, I guess this is about five or six years ago, I decided like I wanted to rewire a whole bunch of the way things were working for me. I didn't, I didn't like it. I felt like stuff wasn't serving me and I just wanted to, to do it differently. I wanted to rewire the house as it were. And when I started to look at those things, like they come up all the time, right? Those little things come up. Maybe you deprive yourself of something or maybe you have to have something, you know, for a long time, I would go to the movies. I had to have popcorn at the movies. Why? Because my mother wouldn't let me have popcorn at the movies and I'm an adult now and I'm going to have my damn popcorn if that's what I want to do you know? Um, And then it was a thing for me for a while. Like I had to do it all the time. I don't have to do it all the time now, but for a little while it was like, I'm treating myself. This is what I want. Right. And we don't necessarily know where some of these things come from. Right. They just show up or my fear of asking for help that I told you about, right. Where my colleague said, how can I help you today? And I went, Oh, I didn't, I didn't even realize I had carried that into work with me that, you know, and uh, then, then, but then I became aware of it, right? So then now that I was aware of that, I was able to work on shifting that. Not sure it's completely shifted, but. Well, you know. we're all work in progress, aren't we? 
And right. uh, so it's becoming more and more aware of where, you know, when things aren't working right, that's a clue. Whatever is an angst, what's pissing us off is a huge clue. Okay. And I, I, I've often, like when I was in my training, it's like when I'm triggered by something, it's my lesson. It's not the other person screwing up or doing something wrong. It's about me. And so taking personal responsibility is a big part of, well, personal development. So, you know, again, the work I do, we typically work with the unconscious stuff and unravel it. It's the quickest way because I find that when we get stuck in overanalyzing it, yes, the stories are good. And for us to have this dialogue is really good. Now, I want to get down to the meats and potatoes, right? Let's get to business. Let's clear it out so we don't have to keep having this conversation of why we do the stupid things we do or why we're not getting what we really want to be fulfilled and happy and have the bank account full and have the relationship that's balanced and harmonious and the well-being, our health. You know, when all that stuff goes haywire, there's something to revisit, right? And to reassess, reprogram, as you said, rewire so that we can get to where we want. And I like to get to the quickest, fastest bottom line. Give it to me. Give me the I the how to and I'll do it. So with you on that, that's why I said to you, well, yeah. I guess if I don't have to know what it is to clear it, I don't have to know what it is to no. manifest it, you know? I, I love the magic of this. And, you know, being that Bewitched was my favorite show as a kid and I Dream of Jeannie, you know, I've, Mom, I've been, you. yeah, I've just been curious. The very first workshop or training I ever did, the first thing I did was meditation. And then the second thing was, you know, Master Key to Riches. So I think ultimately everybody wants what we want. Yeah. Yeah. And some people are natural manifestors in some areas of their life and not so much in other areas. <laughs> so I think, you know, the Bible says that you're, you know, born of the creator. So we are creators. That makes us creators. And that makes us here as a human trying and striving to become a conscious creator. That's, you know, why, not... <clears throat> that's why the tongue is the most dangerous part of the body, right? Because God spoke the world into being and we co-create with what we speak. What we speak, what we see, because we see first and yep. we hear. And so those other spiritual aspects to us that are going on without us realizing it. And so, yeah, when we start to create and change that whole conversation that starts within the stories, we tell ourselves that you're less than or less important than someone else. Let's say you're a girl and all the, all the boys in the family or your parents, I know this was a common pattern, is most families adore and, and cherish the boys more than the girls. And so the boys, you know, would inherit the land, not the girls or the oldest son. Mm -hmm. And there's, they had their reasons for it. And I'm not, you know, judging that, but, you know, and, or um, girls changing their names to be the husband's name. You know, interestingly enough, enough in Islam, they don't, the women don't change their names. And do you know that my, my husband took my name because I had just finished changing my name. I took the, the name that I have actually um, belonged to somebody I had dated when I was in college. And when I got divorced, I wanted to start totally new because names are sacred gifts and uh if I had if I had really thought about it I'd have picked something different for my first name too but I was not in that place where I could really focus so I decided I wanted to change my last name I decided I wanted to take fine for a lot of reasons I took that I had finished changing my name and, and then um my current husband and I decided to get married and I said to him well I said I, I said I'll marry you but I'm never changing my name again this is my name and that's that and so he felt very strongly we should have the same name. And so he took my name, but he tells everyone he lost the bet. Interesting. Well, how has it changed his life since he changed to your name? You know, I've never asked him that. I probably should. <laughs> well, just reflect on it and look at how it's changed. What's his role become? Well, I think that he gets to do, you know, more things that he wanted to do because like he's upstairs gaming now and stuff like that. So um, I think it, in many respects, uh, you know, liberated him from some other things. 
Absolutely. And, you know, because it's a different vibration, you know, what I, most people know that I changed my birth name from my birth name, my first name. So again, I wasn't going back to my maiden name because it was way too long and cumbersome, you know? So, but I changed my first name when I became an American citizen and yeah, it really radically changed things. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, my spiritual growth that led me to want to change my name or, and the awareness of the numerology, et cetera. But the numerology is actually quite the same, but the letters are different, right? So it's fascinating. Karen, was there anything you wanted to say, sweetie, or put up your hand or? Oh, I, you know, I'm just loving the conversation. There's been so many good quotes from both of you. So I sat there and thought, I'm definitely going to re-listen to this because as you said, the word, however you said it was just beautiful, that as you're creating. And so, you know, I, I want to say it just the way you did because it was so beautiful. <laughs> there's been some, I think this has been a really powerful session. Amir, there's so many great things that you did. I'm um, even doing that, that ball of light. And I feel like, and one of the things we had talked about before, I feel like if there is time in the chat, and, and uh, that when you say, okay, this is what you do and you explain it or say, hey, let's do this together and you lead us to it. So I don't know if you're open to that, but you did kind of do it with the gold ball because we had talked about it the other day. And I really love that you kind of took us back through it. I love it when you, if there is time that you take five or 10 minutes to say, let's just go ahead and do this right now. Because I feel like when you're opening yourselves up, it's nice to do a little prayer beforehand, um, whether it's connecting to the spirit or the universe or God or however you want to say it. And also that we're together, that we're, um, you know, surrounded by love and uh, wisdom or however you want to say it. And so I do that before I get on. But I appreciate I that. Setting boundaries is good. I set the space, a sacred space for us in our conversation. <clears throat> but here again, pardon me. <clears throat> um, in the energy work, you know, people often tell me or ask me, how do you protect yourself, right? And so that's sort of a double-edged sword because protection in, in um, connotes the idea that there's something to be fearful of. Yes, like you're being attacked, but really by just thinking that. <laughs> yes. So when when you reframe it and we're like, if I'm greater than or I'm grounded and I'm clear and centered and and present, and the more clear our energy field becomes through the practices from the manifesting challenge, et cetera, and your own, the more consciously clear and present we become the stronger and more clear and resilient our energy field becomes and less permeable or um, recept uh, um, susceptible yes, to energies inflowing. Now, you can't stop energy flowing. I don't care how you protect and call in the angels and this, energy is always moving. That is the nature of energy. So we have to build the awareness of our own energy field, that is mastery. That's where the power becomes. That's what we're doing with the practices to build your energy field so you become a magnet and a repellent. Better yet, you attract a vibration that's going to support you, encourage you, love on you, respect you, value you, because you're holding that vibration. Does that make sense? That was beautifully said because it, it's right. It's, 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 so you attract that which you you seek, but also are. The R right. is important. Right. <laughs> so then you can go in the world, you can go to the market, you can go on lives and be more, um, I guess you could say resilient or not be the effect of your environment. That's what we're trying to do. But none of us have been taught that because everybody's an empath. I'm sorry to say, not everybody. Everybody is sensitive and there's varying ranges, right? Some are super sensitive, some, some are hyper, some are not so much because they've turned their, their chakra system down and off. It's not flowing properly. But ultimately when that's working correctly, we're in tune, we're receptive, we're picking up vibes. There's so many senses that we're using way beyond just your feeling sense. 
And so all of that's coming at you all of the time. That's why I, I say often, you're an archive of all the information since, well, before birth. How about let's just start with the womb. Let's do with what we can consciously take care of. In the womb, you're, you're absorbing all your mother's vibrations, her emotions, her experiences, her beliefs, all of that's going into you. That's like software that you're being downloaded. <laughs> yeah. And then you are you come out of the chute and you keep on doing the same thing, attracting and matching all the vibrations around you. You know, I often say we get to puberty, we start rebelling. What are we rebelling? We're trying to find ourself. We're trying to do things our way. We're trying to express our individuality. And some kids dye their hair, some wear baggy pants, some you know, run away, they start doing drugs. We, we do all these things, but we're really trying to remove our parents' energy from our energy field. That's unconsciously what's going on. So as we're trying to kick all that energy out, we do all this crazy stuff. And of course, our parents go crazy and they don't know what's going on. And they, they try to control us even more and that can make it even worse and on and on and on. Until we say, okay, I got to let go of that energy. It's not good or bad. It's my experience. It's my accumulation. It's part of my journey. And as I release that, I can become the real me. The artist, the, the researcher, the teacher, the, the, you know, motivator, however that is. To be well, the I really loved listening to you and Karen also. I think you should have a podcast, Amira. Maybe we'll do it. We could do it together since Karen was saying she really enjoyed listening to us. And I I pray a lot to you before I do things like like Karen was talking about that connection piece. So yeah, I, I think I somehow oh buy hey there, uh, I bypass some of that because I, I already know it. I set it in. Does that make sense? It's not mm -hmm. like I dismiss it at all. I'm really aligned with it. I just haven't put it into this space. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm shooting from the hip. How about that? I'm just being here for you guys as much as I can because I'm committed to that and it's evolving. So let's see what we create out of this, right? Yeah, I think so that's a beautiful, you that, what you said was a beautiful wrap up. And I do agree, Rebecca, <laughs> you, would, you would do a beautiful podcast, Amira. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, it, again, it's where, where am I going to start from? Do I start with manifesting? Do I start with a spiritual transform? You know, where is my, so that's sort of in the works in the background. Um, you know, my focus was to start by interviewing and there's a whole bunch of interviews on my website. And so let's see, you know, I, I haven't wanted to public speak. I told you guys that this is, you know, pushing Amira out of her comfort zone. So um, especially like I can do, I could talk for hours and hours, and hours with my eyes closed and not on a camera and wondering how people, what, what's going on because I too feel their energies. Right. And so this has been a growth process for me. So I appreciate you guys chiming, chiming in and taking time out of your day and your experiences it really really helps me and it helps whoever's listening to this after yeah well you you do beautifully in your interviews i always say how eloquently and how you handle different circumstances and so i think that's a good indication you know it's like you should have your own radio show but um i finally found i had to go to where there was a window with some good light so i wanted to say oh goodbye. yeah yeah the lighting <laughs> makes a huge difference i did a, a video over in the in the dark area even though i had all the lights on the soft light the outdoor light really makes a difference yeah it shows less wrinkles i can tell you that <laughs> So, so Karen, you, Amira, you, we look less, you know, haggard in the in the in the light from the day. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. So now, ahead, now I have to tell you guys about a lighting story. So Amira okay. knows that I, I had this TV show that I had. Uh, it was on yeah. Amazon. It was on Apple, and it was on Roku. And so one of my friends, you know, was going to be on my show, and we were we were talking about um, I think physical fitness in the pandemic because he's a personal trainer, and so the lighting kept changing. And so he kept like move, trying to move from room to room. And we ended up, we were like, we can't even put this in the pile to go for the show because it's so dark. Oh no. Yeah, <laughs> so lighting is really important. 
Yeah, I told Amira I was going to yeah. order one of those lights, but I, you know, held off because I didn't really need it yet. But it is true. But in photography, you don't go in the glaring sunlight in the middle of the day. You go in the shade if you need to. Yeah. So you're, it, but yeah. Amira, you're right. It's amazing how much younger you look when the, the light, that's why they shine that light. You're still younger. Yeah. I have a ring light. So I can do it in the other areas, but it still is not as nice as daylight or... And I face north here, so yeah. I don't have the best bright light, which is better for filming, actually, right? It's like it's like yeah. before sunrise and just after sunset. Those are the perfect. I think the natural light is is best. And like, yeah. even for, so I have, you know, and Amir, you know this, this is a virtual background. I actually yeah. take a picture from above my desk. Yeah, your hair does, yeah. your hair yeah, does your hair magical. Does. <laughs> yes, I do this magical <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, but even, you know, but with virtual backgrounds, you have to have enough lighting too, because this is probably, I don't have all the lights on around me. So it's also probably a lighting thing. Yeah. Um, I don't want I to know. have my we're, bed. We're, I don't want look, a mirror to be. It's bed. not perfect, but we're doing it. And I sure appreciate <laughs> that you guys. And, and so laughing at all these little, you know, and learning the tricks, say eh? there are tricks to being, you know, uh, an Ellen DeGeneres or an Oprah or somebody, right? Looking good <laughs> on camera. There's a lot of tricks. Hey, you guys, we're we're over our time, but I sure appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I hope uh, whoever's listening to this replay is inspired that um, we can take a nugget and apply maybe those little tools and uh, shift your day to make miracles. Goodbye. See you soon. I'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place.